All right, so we're going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me here today. Again, for those of you who just came in, I'm Michelle Jackson. I work at Palantir as a web strategist, and I'm here with my colleague, Allison Manley, uh, who is also uh, <laughs> something. <laughs> you do everything, so it's hard. It's hard to have a you know a title that encapsulates all the all that you do. But um, technically, it's sales and marketing manager. So but we'll Allison wears so many hats. So um, welcome and thank you for joining us on um, essentially what is a journey and what has been a journey for us to uh, engage uh, folks from both Chicago and Baltimore um, in the Drupal community and give them uh, a set of skills that will allow them to. Uh, not just explore uh, Drupal, but also expand upon their existing skills, uh, technical skills. So making inclusion happen through mentoring. Uh, today we're going to talk about the history of our initiative. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we did last year at the uh, 2017 DrupalCon in Baltimore. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we did this year in terms of our mentorship and training program. We're going to talk about what we did and what went well and then what went not so well. And we're also going to uh, talk a little bit about how we can measure success when we're doing this type of initiative um, and then what's next and then how you can get involved as well. Uh, and so if you're wondering, you know, well, what is this initiative? What is this mentoring? Um, essentially, last uh, Last, I think it was March. Yeah, it was mid camp. At mid camp, 2017, Chris Rooney gave a presentation about uh, essentially diversity within the Drupal community, and we had a lot of contentious conversations at that time happening in the community. And Allison and I wanted to focus on what we think is is important, uh, which is a little bit uh, more action. Uh, oriented and not as discourse based. So we decided we wanted to actually take a more proactive approach with getting folks who perhaps don't even know what Drupal is, are not connected to the community uh, involved and give them an opportunity to really get a taste of what this might be like. Uh, so we started brainstorming after we heard Chris Rooney, who's walking in here, mm -hmm. uh, just speak about uh, diversity uh, in the community. This was his presentation. <laughs> Say hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we did uh, have quite of a whirlwind before, right after mid-camp. Uh, luckily, I was available uh, uh, to actually work on this. So Allison and I collaborated really closely to get students from uh, Baltimore who are already involved with NPower, which is a nonprofit that is uh, distributed throughout the, the country, has multiple chapters. And we wanted to get students involved in uh, DrupalCon. Essentially, we wanted to m give them the opportunity to not only understand what Drupal was, but also meet other people in the, in the community as well. So uh, essentially, what you're seeing here is a day of Drupal. We have a photo here of the cohort of students that we uh, actually work to get into DrupalCon for a day. And um, we gave them a, a really brief overview of what Drupal is. Uh, essentially how you might apply some of you know these basic uh, Drupal con concepts to their understanding of what they can do with their own tech career. So these students actually already had a technical background. A lot of them had existing developer certifications, but didn't necessarily uh, have access to or know about Drupal. And so Ryan actually uh, you know, also led that training that day. Uh, and we also gave students an opportunity to network with folks on the security team. Um, and you're probably like, well, how did you manage to get all of this done in three weeks? Um, well, my background is actually in youth education. So we used to wrangle students um, for the State Department and basically send them overseas. So I'm quite familiar with the wrangling of students. Uh, so that's why we were able to do it. But essentially, what we identified uh, during this process is that partnerships are key. You have to know who has access to, uh, you know, certain groups of students or certain groups of professionals and really be able to leverage those connections. Um, that was really what has made this, this process and the project so successful has been to leverage uh, these existing, uh, not only relationships, but nonprofits that are already uh, well established. Did you want to add anything to that? 
Um, yeah, I would just like to give major kudos to Michelle because um, we did conceive of this after Chris Rooney's talk last uh, March of 2017. He said, you know, he sort of threw down the gauntlet and, and challenged everybody in the room and said, what can you do to increase diversity in Drupal? You know, how, how can we make this an actionable thing? And I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, here's a simple thought. <laughs> what if we actually just sponsored some students in Baltimore to come to DrupalCon Baltimore? You know, how hard could it be? Ha ha, how hard can it be? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and we conveniently have Michelle, who is based in Baltimore on our team, and who also at the time was not resourced to any project. So she did have the time, I had the time, and we were able to find an organization local in Baltimore in NPower that had students that were very excited to come and learn about Drupal for a day. It, it was literally just one day. That was all we could do. Um, we wrangled um, with some help from some wonderful people in the Drupal community at the last minute to get free tickets for all of them to come. We managed to arrange for um, other people in the community to come sit down with us and have lunch after they had sort of this half day of an intro to Drupal and for them to be able to attend some sessions. But it was just a really light taste, right? Just one day of DrupalCon. You know, you've never heard of Drupal before, and then you're thrown into this huge convention center in downtown Baltimore. And so when we, um, when we went through this exercise of lunch and talking with them, we took a step back after it was all over and said, OK, well, that was great. How do we expand this and make this something bigger and better? So then we started meeting internally and talking about, OK, well, what would it look like if we did try to make something larger out of this. And that brings us to what we're working on this year. So uh, essentially, we wanted to understand, is this something that's scalable you know, beyond not just one day, but is this something that's scalable from a program perspective? Um, if we want to scale it, who? You know, are we hoping to get another NPower chapter involved, or are we going to be looking also more at regional uh, nonprofits that may not be tied to NPower. So um, essentially, we had a lot of questions uh, as we were going through this process. You know, capacity, what happens when I'm not available? Uh, what happens when Allison's unavailable? Um, so we'll talk a little bit through that process shortly, but I'll just provide an overview of what the goals of the, the program were coming out of uh, last year's DrupalCon. So we wanted to provide students, or young professionals um, from underserved or underrepresented uh, communities with uh, Drupal training, um, networking, and then an opportunity to attend conferences. Uh, and so essentially, when we say training, we mean not a one-day training, but a more robust training um, so that they're actually equipped with skills to actually be able to build tools in Drupal. Uh, we wanted to have more students involved, um, and that goes back to that question about scaling. Uh, we wanted to uh, create a model that other companies could either replicate or perhaps improve upon. And then also we wanted to uh, expand our own support as a company um, to provide these uh, underserved or underrepresented community members uh, with access and inclusion within the community. And one thing that came up as we were finding uh, these tickets for the students the previous year is I was actually a global a track chair um, previously. So I had access to a lot of speakers uh, track chairs who had extra tickets or whose companies had extra tickets. And so it was through my own uh, access uh, to uh, the, not, not only those resources but also those community members that we were able to essentially connect with the, you know, the DA and, and leverage that partnership to get the free tickets that we did get. So you know, as we're going through the process, we're, we understand uh, kind of our own privilege as being, you know, relatively embedded in the community um, and, and really hoping to use that to give opportunity and access to others who don't have those relationships, don't know who Amanda is, who just came in and gave me a hug, perhaps are not connected with folks who have extra tickets. So looking forward to 2018, we decided to actually focus on Chicago. So our company is based in Chicago, and so as we were having this conversation, about capacity, um, you know, Baltimore was great because I'm there and we have Meg Plunkett, my colleague, who's uh, in Philly, and we have some other folks on the East Coast now too, but Chicago is essentially our hub. We have a lot of folks in, in Chicago who, who live there um, and work for Palantir, and so just from a compa capacity standpoint, uh, it made sense to identify a partner in that region just because we have so many uh, colleagues who live there. Um, and then also that is our home base. So uh, that was the strategic decision that we made after talking about 
you know, where, where was this program going to go and in, in, in what region? But to add to that, when we were talking with our contact at NPower in Baltimore and we asked her, when we were looking for a good Chicago partner to partner up with, um, she said, well, wait a minute, our Baltimore students who went last year want to keep going. You know, is there any way you can keep us in the fold and can we continue this? And so we decided um, actually to split it. So we'd have half the students coming out of Baltimore, half the students coming out of Chicago, because we did have a big enough East Coast presence that we could support that. And then we just accounted for that in our budget. You know, well, we've got to now fly people from Baltimore to Midcamp and Baltimore to Nashville. And um, so that was, that was just something we accounted for early on. Something else that we were considering, um, so, so for NPower, I think we were just lucky that, uh, you know, when I was trying to figure out what partners to uh, connect with, uh, it actually, you know, was, NPower was referred to me by another uh, nonprofit, potential nonprofit partner in Baltimore that could not work with us. I think it was code in the schools, and so they actually told us about NPower. Uh, but I think we lucked out because NPower has several chapters throughout the US, and then also uh, our new partner, our newest partner, Genesis Works, has several locations throughout the US. So when we were thinking about scale, we wanted a, a nonprofit that was distributed, just like the Drupal community, because our goal essentially was to um, essentially identify other partners and agencies and mentors to actually connect them with students that are in their own region as well. And so you'll see here on the left, Empower has, uh, you know, international presence as well in Toronto. Uh, and then we have other, uh, we have West Coast, we have uh, Texas, we have East Coast as well. And then we have, uh, you know, Chicago, uh, Texas again, we have Minnesota. So we wanted to have a, a broad reach um, and uh, a lot of potential in terms of reaching other students who are outside of the chapters uh, with whom we're currently working. So now we're gonna talk about how we did this and how we uh, structured the program. So going back to 2017, we did consider actually identifying high school students. That was going to be very difficult because of the way schools run and when students are in school and parents and permission and uh, absences. So essentially that was something we learned really quickly was not going to work for a, an April conference. Uh, so essentially we wanted to identify uh, folks who were not in high school but perhaps you know early 20s, late teens, who are looking uh, to expand their professional opportunities. Uh, we wanted to essentially identify students who were already within an existing program that another nonprofit was running. So we wanted to focus on a pre-vetted pool of students, not necessarily fill out the, you know, Palantir application, but students who were already committed to another uh, organization's program who were already working on developing their skills, uh, doing some type of training of, of some sort, just because it makes it easier to get them engaged um, versus perhaps doing a more grassroots approach of recruiting uh, applicants on our own. We had a lot of questions about how do we get the students from Baltimore to speak to the students in Chicago and when are we going to have trainings. Um, ultimately, we adopted a remote distributed training program where essentially we had uh, Slack as our medium for communication and then also did a virtual training um, once a week with, with two labs. Uh, so we had one opportunity uh, for in-person training, uh, which was a kickoff, uh, and essentially after that everything was done remotely. Uh, in terms of our format, we were looking at MidCamp as a, a program uh, checkpoint and midpoint so that we could uh, essentially connect with the students again and bring everybody to Chicago. Um, and then of course the students would convene in, in, in uh, Nashville for DrupalCon as well. And so this was our idea uh, and, and, and the concept that we ultimately went with in terms of what expansion would look like, what 2018 would look like. We, we were really concerned about ensuring continued student participation, which is something that will, is a pain point that we'll talk about shortly. But uh, when we're dealing with students who are not in high school, uh, or are not doing a summer program, for instance, where they have unlimited time to dedicate to our program, uh, it's always about balancing um, conflicting priorities. So a lot of the students who we have are working in multiple jobs, 
or internships are potentially doing other training and educational programs, maybe doing other, so other activities related to the nonprofit or the program that they're associated with our partner. So it's a lot to juggle to ask them to actually do our program on top of everything else. So they are not full-time students, they're mavericks, they're juggling a lot of different types of things. Um, and then a lot of them have things going on in their personal life as well. Um, a lot of them have personal responsibility. So uh, that's something that we wanna open the conversation up to you about uh, later is just you know, ensuring continued engagement and participation. Uh, we have a mentorship program in place for these students, but um, are always curious to talk about how we can best support students throughout the process. Do you have anything else to add? No, you're doing great. <laughs> so as Allison had mentioned, we wanted to continue the Empower partnership because our uh, point of contact at Empower, Kathy, still wanted to uh, have students engage. The students were still interested in participating uh, beyond 2017. Uh, we created new strategic partnerships with Genesis Works, Fig Leaf, uh, Drupalize Me, and then others. And so one of the key milestones in our planning was actually deciding whether or not Palantir would run the training or whether we would outsource the training to a Drupal training expert. And we went with the latter because from a capacity standpoint, it was easier for us to find someone who does this professionally as a service um, as, from a company standpoint because it was easier for them to actually uh, just implement a training um, and, and provide access to that training for the students um, versus having us develop our own training um, independently. So that made that process relatively smooth because we didn't have to create all the materials ourselves. Uh, and we could use what they currently use to train developers and other folks learning Drupal. Uh, mentorship by professionals throughout the community. So uh, previously you might have heard me mention kind of the need to have a, a two you know, strategic partners that have chapters all over the US. So similarly, we wanted to have mentors who were also distributed. So we have folks who are uh, mentoring the students virtually from all over the US currently. We have, you know, I'm in Baltimore, but there are other mentors who are, I think we have one um, in Massachusetts, um, all over. So essentially that was really key as well. And you know, we had talked about the need for having a mentor in person or, or not in person, and we decided that as long as there's frequent touch points, so we actually didn't need to have a mentor that was in person on the ground. Um, I do think there's value in having that, but we found that it was not necessary in terms of the coaching that would, uh, that would complement the training that we were running. So some of the questions that we were uh, tackling while we were coming up with an implementation plan were, you know, who is gonna do the training? We decided with, uh, that Fig Leaf would be doing that, but you know, where is this gonna live? Where is this going to be hosted? You know, where are students going to have their projects? Um, you know, where, where is this going to live? Um, we wanted to address both technology and hosting needs uh, because we weren't sure if the students would have Mac laptops, um, and so we wanted to, or access to the internet regularly. You know, Baltimore specifically uh, doesn't have uh, significant density in terms of um, internet access all across the city, so we didn't want to make assumptions about, you know, access to Starbucks because if students are in certain communities where they don't have those resources, they might have to take an hour bus to get there. So, you know, these were things that we were thinking about. Um, we, we didn't end up providing internet, but we did provide laptops that were refurbished uh, just so that they had that. Um, and then they might have to worry about a mobility issue of getting to a you know, point A to get the internet, but they don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I don't have a laptop. Uh, also, you know, where are they going to be training? Um, you know, what types of hosting environments do they need for what they're going to be building? Um, that was something that we, had to wrangle a little bit, had some hiccups at mid-camp. Do you want to talk, talk about that? Sure. <laughs> so right a couple days before mid-camp, um, the hosting that they were on expired. And um, so what was lovely was that at mid-camp, of course, there was a large team of Pantheon employees who were very happy to, to come in, and they spent uh, a couple hours just making sure everyone was put up on a, a Pantheon environment and spun up, and, and it was all said and done in a few hours. And um, But that was... That was one of those things we hadn't anticipated. You know, now that we've done this pilot program once, there are a few there are a few things I'd do differently moving forward. You know, um, we did a lot of things right. I'd say about 80, 85 percent of the things we did right. There's definitely some things we want to smooth out moving forward. That was one of them. I would say the other was 
yesterday when my plane got delayed by a freak snowstorm in Chicago and I had students trying to check in to the Holiday Inn and they needed a credit card to put down and I was not there to provide a credit card. <laughs> so thankfully one of my other colleagues, you know, I'm, I'm on the tarmac saying, please help me get a credit card over to <laughs> So uh, we were, that was one of those things you can't anticipate, but um, I'll file it away for future reference. So. Another question we had was getting them to Chicago and Nashville, uh, you know, when do we book those flights? Um, how do we fund, you know, paying for those flights? Is that something that Palantir incurs? Is that something that we'll get outside support for? Uh, we ended up uh, incurring the cost for those as part of Allison's uh, marketing budget. You know, where are they going to stay? Um, are they gonna stay in a hotel? Are they gonna stay in a hotel by the conference? Are they gonna stay in a hostel? Um, another question is just, you know, who do we need to notify? Like, you know, emergency contacts was something we were thinking of too, just because technically, um, you know, everybody is of age, I think, um, you know, 18 or older, but again, you know, who do we call if somebody sprains an ankle? Um, again, like I said, who will pay for uh, kind of the cost of coming to, to Nashville? Uh, how do we get mentors and then what are the expectations? You know, do we just say we want you to talk to them about something twice a week or once a month and then what do we tell them to talk about? Is it really focused on their long-term professional goals or is it focused on the training? Um, we didn't really nail that down. We, we just wanted mentors to be available to answer questions in terms of the training, but that was a question that we had when we were uh, identifying mentors and coming up with the idea of having that tertiary support. So we have our lab, our class, so there's an instructor. Ryan attended all of the classes and labs with the exception of maybe like, I don't know, one or two. So he was always present, but we understood that, you know, having everybody go to Ryan also was a lot to ask. So um, wanting to distribute some of that uh, support was key. The other question was, who is gonna review student work? So uh, my background is primarily in research and UX. So essentially, I can, I'm happy to sit in, but what I'm able to support the students in is, is a little bit limited. So you know, not just having people available, but having people available who are capable of providing the support that students need. So we always had to have somebody um, attending the lab who could answer questions for the students um, that, that related to what they were uh, being trained on. And then at mid-camp, I think we ended up corralling some palantiri to review student work. I know Lauren is here, and Lauren spent some time with students reviewing their projects that we'll talk about shortly. So uh, definitely, it's very much an agile project. <laughs> uh, I would say it's probably one of the more agile projects I've done since I've been at pa Palantir. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so that's something that I think I'm, I, I'm grateful for, because uh, we were able to modify our, our, our programmatic approach um, as needs change throughout the course of the program. So this is a timeline of what the program looked at from a bird's eye view from the kickoff in January 2018 uh, where we gave the students their refurbished laptops and then began uh, to pair them with mentors all the way to the beginning of classes, mid-camp that uh, checkpoint or milestone, and then we have DrupalCon and then um, you know, we're hoping to talk to students about where they go from here. I know for me, one of the things I talked about was Drupal GovCon. So the Baltimore students, you know, it's a free conference, it's relatively close to Baltimore. So seeing if the students can get engaged uh, with that conference is something that's on my mind, but also thinking about this more broadly. You know, do we connect Drupal shops uh, with and Power and Genesis Works chapters in other areas. Ideally, yes, that's what we wanna do. Um, just so that we can ensure uh, that we're actually able to create a framework that can uh, support students. Not just the ones that we are training and mentoring currently, but other ones who uh, have similar interests and needs as well. So this is a photo from the uh, Genesis Works uh, kickoff. So these are the Chicago-based students with Lauren. And then this is uh, the Baltimore cohort as well on the same day. So it was really neat that we were able to have two in-person meetings and then connect virtually and then having the students all meet up in, in Chicago. 
Um, I think we used Adobe. Do we use Adobe, Adobe Connect? Adobe Connect, yeah. We so Dave from Figleaf, who's there on the far right, um, he, uh, he was our partner at Figleaf who actually led the training every Friday evening, and that was the evening that the students, via a survey, said was the best night for them to have their formal class. We had lab hours, one hour on Wednesday, and then there were two options on Thursdays. You didn't have to attend all of them. We just recommended you attend at least one so that you could check in and mentors would come to those lab hours as they could also come, you know, whatever worked for their schedules between those three choices during the week. And then there was the formal class time um, and that was all recorded as well because there were some students who Friday night just didn't work for them. It, it worked for the majority, but not for everybody. So there were some students who I don't think attended a live class ever, but always watched the recordings and were able to keep doing their work um, through the course of the, of the program. Yeah, one student said that that was what was really helpful was actually having access to the recordings because, again, like I mentioned before, a lot of students are doing a lot of things at the same time. They have the personal life, they have multiple professional lives, and then some of them are also doing additional training as well. So that flexibility, I think, was uh, key. One student had said, you know, I like that we have that flexibility, that we have access to the, the video recordings, um, and that we are maybe not attending the same labs um, it may not always be in class, but we're working towards the same goal. So there was still a sense of shared community um, across the cohort as well. And I'll, and I'll let the students who are actually here uh, share with you their project shortly. So in terms of what we covered, it wasn't just this is how you Drupal. Uh, we talked about goals of your site, why you would want to build a website in the first place. I think a key question was to help them see a problem in their community um, and then figure out how to address it with Drupal. Uh, so we have a lot of really neat community projects that students are working on that relate to music, churches, a mariachi band. And so students were able to create a nexus between an, an issue related to content or marketing in their community and then tie it back to Drupal, which has been really exciting. But they went over um, analytics, content modeling, content types and fields, information architecture, menu and blocks, forms and social media. So essentially this is a crash course in, in Drupal um, that covers a lot of other strategic pieces as well. So in terms of what we learned, we learned that scheduling is really hard, <laughs> really hard. Um, sustainability is also a big pain point because my initial involvement was very much based on my circumstances then and my availability um, where I didn't have uh, a lot of project work. And then when I did, I couldn't play as active as a role as I had previously, which I knew coming out of the con last year, but in terms of how do we then, you know, make sure that Allison isn't resourced to this project 80 hours a week, um, since Allison does have other roles as well, was something that you know, constantly came up. Uh, you know, balancing, from a student perspective, class, life, work, uh, attrition. We did have some students uh, essentially drop out of the program. So anticipating that um, was something that we did, but developing an action plan is something that I think we still need to do. Yeah. So initially when we talked about you know, expansion, you know, one colleague I said, well, let's just have a few students. And I said, from what I know with youth ed education, we should definitely have um, more students because there will be attrition. But how do we mitigate that is a question I think that warrants further discussion. Uh, managing expectations. Uh, you know, how do we get funding and from whom? Delegation. Uh, especially when you have conflicting resourcing, uh, communication, um, the logistics, not just around travel, but also having students uh, connect with each other throughout the program and stay engaged and involved was something that came up time and time and again. Uh, limited time, money, resources came up uh, quite frequently as well. And then also, how do we measure what success looks like was something that I think we're still, we're still grappling with um, because it is in a pilot phase. But, you know, what is success? Does it mean that they have a, you know, minimum viable uh, product? You know, is it that the website is workable, usable? Um, or is it something else? Um, you know, is it that they get a job in a parallel field? Is it that they get a job at a Drupal shop? You know, what does success look like, look like is still something that we're, we're 
we're contemplating. And, and you can join us at lunch with them all this week if you'd like to talk with them about possible internships. I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> Uh, I think the question that Ryan posed was, you know, mentoring, when does this begin and when does, does it end ever? I think Ryan had said mentoring is a, technically a lifetime commitment. Um, so you're not necessarily, hi, I'm going to mentor you for five weeks and then I'm going to drop off the face of the earth. Ideally, you want to be able to create a relationship that, uh, outla you know, essentially outlasts the program. Um, so how do we do that? That goes back to managing expectations with mentors. Uh, I think... We had three lab hours, but there were only about half the students who were incredibly active. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, within the lab. And so are our expectations reasonable? Is it asking too much? I mean, these are things we're constantly reevaluating. Re Initially, we thought we could do a two hour class um, once a week, um, but that made, scheduling just made this very difficult. Um, I think right now, we don't have a, strong model to assess success. Um, we don't have grades in midterms. Um, so that's definitely something that we're still thinking about. Um, we did take attendance uh, for a few weeks, but you know, you have some students who are attending and some students who are not, but are, are watching the video recordings. We don't really have you know, Google Analytics for our program. So to, to, to make an assumption about engagement is also not fair because some students might be you know, juggling the million things that they juggle, but then also watching the recordings. Um, and so that's something we're thinking about too. You know, do we have, you know, learning assessments? Is it really just gonna be about their project and, and do they hit this particular milestone? Um, I think a question one person asked was, you know, if we had this in person, you know, would, would that make things easier, right? If we had the students in Chicago attain, you know, attend a weekly training in person and then the Baltimore students do the same thing. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that engagement and participation is not necessarily always constrained by whether something is remote or not. I think that if we had had in person, I, I'd I'd argue that we might sim see similar patterns of people not showing up for class. And that's just been my experience with, with youth education. So I don't know that in-person would always, at least training would, 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 would necessarily create kind of more engagement. I do think in-person checkpoints with mentors might help because it increases accountability and then you have a better rapport potentially. And, and to add to that, um, we did actually, the Genesis Works folks, um, Julia is here from Genesis Works, uh, who is their alumni coordinator. She and Chris Rooney actually did, I believe twice, get together at Digital Bridges offices so that everyone could work together and talk about how things were going and, um, you know, just especially when it came like what to, what to focus on for mid-camp, you know, what to focus on for DrupalCon. So there were some touch points physically where the students got together in Chicago. Um, that was not something we did in Baltimore. Um, in retrospect, that probably would have been a great idea. Um, but again, it was just a matter of resources and, um, you know, lessons learned that we, uh, I think we would like to implement moving forward. So again, I think measuring success is definitely something that we're still working on. Uh, I think the way I think about it is, you know, formulating a series of questions the way I do with projects, uh, and you know, thinking about it in this context. So this is kind of where we are. We're still in the, you know, inquisitive phase um, about how we would go about doing this. Um, but here are some ideas that we have, and then after our session concludes, we open, we'll open the floor to get your ideas as well. Uh, so, you know, what do students know at the start of the program? Um, you know, what do we want them to learn? Um, why? And then how do we measure that? Uh, the other one is, you know, what do, does attendance and does attendance matter? Um, is it, you know, bodies and rooms, people just showing up to mid camp, is that success? Or is it actually having, you know, a website that your community can actually use? Um, is it having content that makes sense within the website that you've built? Uh, you know, are students merely gonna meet curriculum milestones? Or again, is it about the usability of, uh, and es essentially the, the function of the website? Um, is it launching the website? Uh, is it a percentage? Uh, is it how often students check in with mentors? 
is it also something that we can change mid-program? <laughs> because that's not really how, you know, we usually, with Google Analytics, you know, as a parallel example, you're not supposed to change kind of how you measure things in the middle of, you know, something, because you'll lose that data, right? So then if we are making modifications, does that then have implications for how we're measuring what success looks like? Uh, something else is, you know, what happens after the program? You know, I mentioned Drupal, GovCon, but, you know, again, mentorship is a lifetime commitment. So what does that post-program engagement look like? So these are all things that we're thinking about. We've thought about using surveys and one-on-ones to gauge, um, but again, uh, this is a little bit more nebulous than a cut-and-dry program uh, that you might see with um, nonprofits that are well-established in this area. So here's an example uh, at MidCamp. You know, we did have uh, Palantiri help students review their work to date. And then that way they were able to gauge kind of pain points and areas where they needed help. Here they are. Last night. Yes. <laughs> Everyone to get, I think that's everyone but one who, you know, again, talk about work commitments. She couldn't miss work yesterday, so she had to fly in very late. She did not make it to her hotel last night until 1.15 in the morning, but she is here. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so at this point, uh, like I mentioned before, students are, who are coming in now, are um, <laughs> doing a lot of these personal projects that have a community focus. So I'd mentioned before there's a mariachi band. Mm -hmm. I love that you're coming in here while I'm talking about you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a church, a music act, um, a recycling blog, a tech help blog, and then uh, some others as well. And so um, we wanted to, like I mentioned before, give them a well-rounded uh, you know, training that encompassed both UX and strategy, and not just Drupal, because we don't want them to just build, build, build. We want them to think about why they're building, and then what model in your life makes the most sense, or problem in your life makes the most sense um, in terms of using that uh, as a platform for a Drupal project. Uh, I think we have about 60% uh, Drupal or 70% Drupal and then 30% non-Drupal, um, but we're hoping that they can take some of the lessons that we uh, taught to, you know, about identifying audience needs and planning your menu structure um, and actually can carry some of those skills and knowledge uh, into their next job, even if that's not within uh, a Drupal context. Um, I think we're thinking about resume workshops as well, just to make sure that the way that they're communicating their skills makes sense for the job that they're looking for. Uh, and then also hoping to do some coaching around interviewing. And then also, um, I was thinking about Drupal GovCon for the Baltimore-based students just because it's so close. And some of the resume workshop uh, work is actually happening tomorrow. Like the, a lot of the students did bring their resumes already, but our HR, um, Staff at Palantir is going to be sitting down with them tomorrow to look over their resumes and see if there's any polishing that we can help them with. And also, um, I'll, I'll mention this again, we're really curious about what you think mm -hmm. um, we could do differently. And also, if you're interested in starting a similar program or joining the program um, in your own communities. Um, because we can always do things better. And as you mentioned, we're definitely learning as we're going along. And I think, interestingly, a lot of my background, actually, you know, we would have had a credit card authorization, right? We would have had a lot of these things. And so because I am not doing that full time anymore, you know, it, it was difficult for me to, to say, like, hey, Allison, here is like all the things that you need for our youth program because, you know, I'm coming in here and there. And again, it's a capacity question. Um, well, and there was a snowstorm. I there was, was a to be, snowstorm. I was supposed to be there to do right. that. Right, so. exactly. <laughs> but, um, because I know we're running low on time. Um, so some of the lessons that we did learn, definitely that identifying the strategic partnerships up front was key, finding the right students. Um, I mean, I don't know how else we would have found students just on our own to, to do this, but having, having organizations that already had students that were interested in code um, was a great thing. Um, and then also um, just being able to have the time, um, the retrospective that we were able to do last year after our one day at DrupalCon to sit down and sort of implement the plan to the degree that we did. Um, obviously, we, we can fill in some more details now that we've done this for a year, but, um, but we'll be having a retrospective after this one as well just to see how we can implement this moving forward. 
Um, the one thing I would like to talk about is that this was not free. Um, I, um, speaking of privilege, I have the privilege of being in charge of my budget. So um, when I was outlining my budget for all of how we were going to, um, for all of my needs within Palantir for marketing and sales, sales trips, um, conferences that we have to attend, I wanted to put some aside some money to make this successful. So Palantir actually, in hard costs, donated $8,000, which really was um, allocated mostly to travel. That was hotel, that was plane tickets. Um, DrupalCon tickets and mid-camp tickets were donated thanks to those organizations. Um, of course, the mentors gave their time. Um, Palantir also donated 11 refurbished laptops. Um, and, but Figleaf actually donated more. I mean, their donation of the classes was about $12,000 in costs because to take one of their basic Drupal classes is about $1,100 a person. So um, then, of course, Drupalize Me and Acquia did donate some subscription and hosting fees. Um, and then we did later on, after this slide was made, got um, some donations from JetBrains. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, um, uh, and then also at the last minute to help us offset some costs, um, Ashley Thevenet of Blue Spark, when I was telling her that um, the hotel rooms in Nashville were actually coming out more expensive than I thought they were, she said, you know what, we have a whole extra Airbnb house. Would you like to have it? So she very graciously donated one of her two houses that they had reserved, so we were able to help split some costs that way. But this, as far as hard costs, was, was what it cost Palantir to do this. So um, if that is scary to your organization, if you're not able to support that type of um, uh, lift, and also, you know, we can't expect Fig Leaf to be donating for everybody, right? You know, like that's, that's a big ask. But, um, you know, maybe don't start with 10 to 12 students. Start smaller. Start with three. Start with two. Whatever you can do. But um, that, that is just something I want to uh, put out there is that even, even though there was a lot of time donated, there were actually some hard costs as well. Another way to think about it, too, is, you know, when you have brown bags, right, you have colleagues share their expertise in a particular area, they talk about a case study. Think about, you know, if you do, if you, if you aren't distributed, or even if you are, um, you know, when you have a co-working space and you have a session, right? Think about who you're inviting. Think about who you're including. I just wrote a, a blog post that was actually about diversity and the idea of diversity itself. And one of the main goals here was to kind of strip that and talk about access. Strip that term away and say, like, who are you inviting? Who are you networking with? Who are you connecting with? Who comes to your parties? Who comes to your Drupal events? Who comes to your, you know, UX meetups? Who are you associating with? Because that is that is the root of the issue. Not so much, you know, this diversity term. You know, I am diverse. You are not. You know, it, that creates a dichotomy of, of basically you're an other and I am not, and I'm part of this and you're not. And so instead, you know, thinking about it in terms of like when you look around and you think about, you know, not just who's in a room, but who are you going to get drinks with? Who are you going to like talk about this module with? Who are you planning to do, you know, to, to submit that issue on um, you know, Drupal.org and, 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 and create a program or create an improvement in a specific area? Thinking about like that type of inclusion is really where we're going with this versus kind of a, you know, there's a diversity problem. There's an access problem and there's a problem with, you know, habits, and there's a problem with who you know, we associate and network with, and who, who makes us comfortable, and who we're comfortable being around. So really tackling this from more of a you know, community grassroots perspective, where it's about you know, taking someone's hand and saying, join, join, join us for this coffee meetup. You know, join us for this particular event. That is really what we think needs to happen. And so Allison says the budget might be a bit tight for some folks, but definitely there's other ways that are affordable where you can include people and invite folks who are from, you know, either uh, you know, tech-oriented nonprofits and have them be a part of community events. Um, have them be a part of an open house and just get them you know, in the door. Get them to meet folks. And that's free for most people if you have an existing event or program. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we are, this is not an original idea by any means. Um, we just had the ability to implement it. But Rachel from the DA had hooked me up with Crispin down here on the bottom, who is doing something very similar in England. He has the benefit of government money, so they are able to do this um, with a government-funded apprenticeship, but they've been doing something similar for about five years, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's his website if you want to check it out, um, because it's pretty fascinating, and he's got a little bit more um, structure to his program than we certainly have to ours. And I'm, I'm definitely going to add that 
you know, this took a very large village of people. You'll see the list of names of all the people that helped us in some way or another. Um, this, it was a long list. I mean, we had a bunch of mentors help us out. We had a lot of people organizing in, in a variety of ways. And then we had additional support, everyone from, you know, donating a house to donating subscriptions to things to stepping in at the last minute, helping us with hosting when hosting blew up at Midcamp. So um, there was a lot of hands in this, and we really appreciate everyone's help in, in just trying to bring in new faces into Drupal. You know, I mean, I think it's, I think, and that's part of what we were trying to do was, you know, there are a lot of uh, many, many people who have never heard of Drupal at all, but are very talented. You know, how do we invite them in? So this was our way of taking their hand and bringing them in and say, hey, there's this amazing thing called Drupal. We'd like to introduce you to it. We'd like to train you in it a little bit. And then if you decide, you know, it's up to you. If you want to decide that you want to keep going with it, um, we can help you and support you in that. And here's a seat at the table. Yeah. That's kind of the message we want to give. Yeah. Um, so I, before we jump into kind of, actually before we do that, okay, I would sorry. like the students to actually introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the work you've done to date. Would you be, would you be willing to step up to the mic and share a little bit about your experience? <laughs> Come on, Joseph. <laughs> Let's get a hand for the students. Hi, Damien. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Patterson, and I'm with Genesis Works um, in Chicago. Um, yeah, basically, I was introduced to Drupal uh, through Genesis Works um, and given the opportunity to learn more about um, site building. Um, I expressed interest in technology at a, a, a in high school, um, and for me, it was more about finding opportunities that align with um, how to um, make my interests come in, into action, if you will. Um, so yeah, this is like a perfect segue um, into getting to you know learn more about site building and stuff. Um, but yeah, for me, I have been going through. Uh, the course and mentoring with uh, uh, Damien is my mentor, so we meet um, every week and, and yeah, we just go over things about Drupal and um, how to get more custom to it. But I basically just wanted to start off with something that um, was more personal to me and um, kind of getting myself more accustomed to what Drupal is. Um, so I started off with like a, um, a personal site, a portfolio site, so um, getting myself out there. I wanted to, in the future, if I ever wanted to look for an internship and stuff like that, I wanted to build a site that had um, my resume, um, my social media links, and all that. Um, so you know, people could just go there, see um, what I'm able to do, and then you know, based off of that, they would um, yeah, just get to know more about me. But yeah, uh, through um, this mentorship, mentoring program, I've been able to um, accomplish that at a very reasonable rate. And uh, yeah, it's just the the progression is has been uh, very exciting so far, and, and I'm looking forward to more to come, so, yeah. What are you doing on Friday? Thanks for listening. Um, Friday, what's happening on Friday? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually partaking in, uh, I'm partaking in, in uh, what's it called? The, the coach the friend. yeah, there you go, that's what it's called. So, yeah, I'm also looking forward to that because it'll be a first time for me, and also, yeah, getting to know more about the people who are in there and, like, how to uh, contribute as well, so looking forward to that. Yeah, Thank thanks for listening. You. <laughs> All right, so hi, um, similar to Joseph, oh wait, I should introduce myself first, my name's Yasmin, um, similar to Joseph, I was introduced to Drupal through Genesis Works. Um, because of Genesis Works, I became more interested in technology and computer science, I'm currently a computer science major um, in Chicago. Um, and so one of the most important things for me um, going into this, deciding like, oh, I wanted to major in computer science, is that I wanted to explore the different venues because I know the term itself, computer science, is so vague and there's so many different branches of it. Um, so when this opportunity came up to learn about Drupal, which is like, you know, web development and could do so much more than that, um, I jumped at it because um, it seemed like a good route to learn more 
And um, that's something that I, I really wanted to take advantage of. Um, you know, I've heard from a lot of people that they wish that they've heard about Drupal when they were younger or like they were trained at an earlier age or like they, they really want these kind of experiences when they're younger because they really appreciate it now. And I'm very grateful to have, you know, been part of this um, along with the other, the other students that I'm with. And what's your website, Yasmin? Oh, um, so my website um, is a passion project um, for mariachi. Um, so I've been playing mariachi music since I was like nine years old. Um, and so I'm currently a mentor at um, an organization in Chicago. And so I wanted to come up with an idea of something that, you know, they could showcase um, other talented students um, in the Chicago area. And she told us she told us she went to a mariachi conference, and I'm dying to see what that looks like one day. <laughs> by the way, do any of the other students want to share? Justin. Woo. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Justin Lang from Empower in Baltimore. Um, pretty much my first experience was at DrupalCon 2017 in Baltimore. Um, pretty much it was like getting my feet wet. Honestly, like. In terms of swimming, like you step in the water. It was like not much I learned about Drupal at 2017. You know, DrupalCon is just the first real experience of it. But so far through the initiative program, I've learned more about it. In terms of like swimming, actually, you know, actually getting your first stroke in the water, swimming, learning more about Drupal. For me, I want to learn more about it to understand more. Learn as much as I can about it. Maybe, you know, broaden my horizons forever in Drupal. For me, my, my own passion is like, you know, network technology. I have a degree in it from Community College of Baltimore County, Essex. Um, I'd actually like to learn more about it, maybe like help my community out with it, with tech help. For me, my first personal project for my website is a tech help website. For me, my family call me the IT support. <laughs> they must have come to me for like tech problems and like something with like a virus or something, help them out with it, kind of get rid of it. So that's pretty much my project. <laughs> So we only have a few minutes left to take questions, but we're happy to hang out in the lobby and take as many questions as you want. But I do want to say that we are continuing the conversation. We're having a BOF um, at 2.15, Inclusion in Action. And then also Julia from Genesis Works was very generously willing to host her own BOF for the first time, even though she's never been to DrupalCon before, just talking about how you can partner with nonprofits to reach diverse audiences. So. Thank you very much. Questions? I'm sure there are many. Hopefully, maybe. Sure. Oh. <laughs> yeah, because they're recording. Okay. Uh, my question is well. Let's turn it around. Okay. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your experiences with measurement, um, just because I run a very similar internship program as you do, that it's ending its second cycle in May, and I want to implement more of the resource um, component for my students as well. Um, but I require that all students apply for experiential course credit through local universities, and that really helps with the uh, measurement component because there's fixed parameters in which they have to meet to get the university credit requirement, um, as well as an hour requirement. So even if it's not all in-person work, they have to document that and track it. So that's really helped for me in terms of the parameters to evaluate them on. Um, and then in the end of the internship, they have to do a final presentation in person or virtual, their choice. Um, but it's a presentation of a final brand package, including their website. So it's basically like a business pitch. And that is a great point that I can evaluate their full like scope of work on. Um, but speaking to those, I just didn't know if you had any more specific measurement points that you were looking to implement or that you did try and maybe didn't work out. So I would say that we were considering using a survey to measure kind of students' understanding and comprehension of core concepts like in the, in the middle of the program. But a question I have for you is that not all of our students are enrolled in a university. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend in that, con in that context? So I, feel, I feel like your presentation idea is spot on. And then also the hour requirement. Um, I think that makes sense too. Uh, I think because we have some students who are watching recordings, it might be hard to, to measure, you know, that as well, um, and so that would be self-reporting. But I'm mm -hmm. curious if you don't, if, if our cohort is kind of a mixture of some folks are in college mm -hmm. um, and some folks aren't, what would you recommend for those folks who are not in college? 
I think you could implement the same kind of measurement system that career centers use at universities because they have those parameters pretty publicly available. So you could use the same um, tools and resources to track their experiences and measure them the same way. Um, but if you are looking towards expanding and getting scholarships, um, these experiential credit hours at most universities usually aren't incredibly expensive, depending on if they're in-state and have a local resident. Um, so it's something you could maybe offer a scholarship for at some point, too, where they could get academic credit for it. OK, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Mark? Hi. Um, just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about Genesis Works and Empower, like what they, what the organizations do, and just a little bit more about that. Yeah, for right, Gen right. Julia from Genesis Works mm -hmm. can talk to that. Mm -hmm. I'll have Michelle talk to Empower. I would say Genesis <laughs> can probably speak to it. Um, thanks for the applause, Joseph. That was nice. Um, so my name is Julia Logan. I work at Genesis Works. Um, we are a workforce development nonprofit. So we were founded in Houston 16 years ago. Um, we've expanded to five other cities um, that Allison and, and Michelle had up there. So the core program, um, our students get training the summer before their senior year of high school. And they in Chicago, they receive training in either IT or accounting. Um, in Houston, they also have some engineering as well because of the clients they have based in, in Houston and the folks that they work with there. Um, so it's 160 hours of really rigorous, robust training. They get half of that in their IT or accounting, and then the other half is in business professional skills. So how to do impromptu public speaking, um, how to write professional emails, how to engage with colleagues in the workplace. And then once they've successfully completed their summer training, they are placed in internships for their senior year of high school. This is true for across all sites. So they go to school in the morning of their senior year, and then they work from 1 to 5 Monday through Friday. Um, they are, Yasmin was, worked at the IT help desk at Accenture. Joseph worked in IT help desk at Spencer Stewart. Um, Malik, I forget where you interned. Uh, Malik interned at TransUnion. Um, Natasha was at um, Kirkland and Ellis, which is a huge law firm, and she was the person who sent phishing emails and then would send you a um, don't get fished when they got fished uh, response email. <laughs> um, so she worked with the securities team. Um, and so they have really, when I'm kind of giving those examples, they have really meaningful, robust internships. It's not making coffee and, you know, fetching coffee and making copies. And then my role is we continue to provide support for six years out of high school. So from 18 to 24, I work with our students on college and career success. So if they're starting in a two-year school, helping them transfer to a four-year school, getting a certificate and start working right away. Our um, organization's mission is that our students gain economic self-sufficiency. So that looks like a lot of different ways for our students. It's not necessarily a four-year degree. So we kind of see a lot of different paths to, to economic success. Um, and so that's kind of the, the overall synopsis of, of who we are at Genesis Works. And I'm just going to invite Justin to really quickly, um, if you can come up and, and, and chat a little bit about NPower, that would be great. And then we have to actually close, unfortunately, because there's another session that's coming in here. Okay, so pretty much Empower is a nonprofit organization. Pretty much they help undeveloped youth, pretty much 18 to 24, um, give them technological skills to eventually attain the Conte A plus certification. For me personally, I had like a strong technical background, pretty much from high school and the college as well. So pretty much it was like a refresher course for me for Empower. And it kind of helped me attain my Conte A plus certification. Pretty much cost free. And they, they do internship placements Yes. They do internship placements and eventually it help you attain a job as well. Welcome. <laughs> so thank you everyone for your time. If you want to continue the conversation like Allison said, we'll be outside for the next five to ten minutes or so, but then we'll also have the BOF uh, in uh, room uh, 203B from 2.15 to 3.15. So if you're about to jet into another session, you can always catch us there as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.